Hello, uh, I'm Nicolas Veron uh, at uh, Bruegel in Brussels and at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to introduce this session, which will look at the Commission's action plan and uh, how to think about it at this juncture. Um, I uh, will first give the floor to Alexandra George Schroeder, the Deputy Director General for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union, DG FISMA, at the European Commission. We'll have reactions from Sven Eagle, uh, member of the European Parliament, and uh, Sébastien de Brouwer of the European Banking Federation. Unfortunately, Laure Briot, who was supposed to uh, also be on the panel, uh, is not going to join us today for overriding personal reasons. Um, we will miss her. Uh, that uh, will uh, just uh, uh, mean uh, one less uh, point of view uh, in the panel, but we will try to offset that with uh, more participation from the audience. With that, Alexandra, over to you. Nicola, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. And let me first say that I'm very pleased for this opportunity to kick off the last morning session before the lunch of today's conference on AML CFT. Uh, and before I go into that, I would uh, first of all like to thank the organizers uh, for this, I think, very excellent initiative that is also very timely. The experts of you will know that we are heading ahead of a plenary of the FATF next week. And we are also um, shortly before uh, the Commission's, I think, awaited uh, package on anti-money laundering. Uh, what I would uh, like to start and to kick off today, uh, uh, my introduction in this panel is a bit more forward looking, is about the way ahead how we can best enhance uh, our efforts to prevent financial crime in the European Union, of course, also taking into account that financial crime is a global phenomenon. And for that, I would be very clear from the start. Uh, we need a rethink and a reform of our AML strategy if we really want to win our fight against crime. This is behind our vision for the Union's future AML system. We have set out in the Commission's action plan of uh, May last year. And as uh, you, certainly many of you will know, this action plan has been centered around six uh, headlines uh, that range from implementation, a single rule book, how we can better do with supervision, how we can best a use make of financial intelligence units, the criminal law aspect, but of course also the, the, the internal aspects. And uh, from our point of view, they are equally important. Uh, what I would like to do today but in my introduction, and we can come maybe to the other points a little bit later in our discussion, is that I would like uh, to focus uh, on three elements, single rule book, uh, supervision, and also how we move uh, ahead uh, with FRUs, because all these three uh, elements cannot only be done by better implementation of the existing rules by policy initiatives, but they need really uh, legislative initiatives, so hardcore legal, legal basis. Um, of course, there is a big question mark around when is the Commission coming with its package, and what I can tell you today is that we are possibly in the final stages uh, to present uh, those reforms still heading for an adoption by the College of the Commissioners in July, so before the summer holidays. Nevertheless, I think I can share at least with you some thoughts today about our plans uh, with some more detail uh, than uh, we have had in the EU action plan I was just uh, mentioning. And of course, uh, it is clear that everything I will say today should, however, be taken subject to confirmation by the College of Commissioners. But you get a sneak preview. Uh, you are already aware uh, that uh, what I said in the beginning, there are two main building blocks uh, for the reform, more harmonized EU rules, and of course also a quite far-reaching institutional change we plan with uh, something we would call an AML authority at EU level. Let me first give you a bit an idea of what we have in mind about the EU rules. As you know, uh, so far and for many, many years, we have based uh, our EU AML uh, book, uh, a key on directives uh, that set objectives, leave member states the details, 
how to reach these objectives. And of course, so many of you will know that often directives work quite well in EU cooperation. I have, on the other hand, to say in the area of IML, this has not been a real success story. Um, and I see two reasons for that. Uh, first, uh, it is possibly also true that our EU AML rules still suffer from a lack of sufficient detail. So that is something to look into. Uh, but second, I think it is important also to say that the transposition by the member states, that is a very big part of this uh, working together, has not delivered the desired results, often what I would call too late or too little. Uh, and as we all know, this resulted in a number of weak links across our internal market, which is, of course, the overall objective. And we want this to come to an end. Rules that the private sector, and I see Sebastian in our call, will have to follow will be laid down in a directly applicable the regulation, so this is the plan for the for the reform, uh, and uh, this this change in the legal vehicle, uh, we would like uh, to create more clarity, more predictability, but also more harmonisation. Having said this, uh, we still plan to leave some margin to member states, especially in relation how they in the end wish to structure their national system. And we also have to respect subsidiarity. Uh, but this, and I want to be very clear from that in the start, doesn't mean that the current situation would continue. We know about shortcomings in national supervision, and we also know that the work of financial intelligence units, especially when it comes to cross-border cooperation, is not perfect, to say the least. So more is needed, and we intend to address these shortcomings. Uh, I would also to be very clear with you that going for more stringent harmonization does not, in our view, contradict the well-established principle that our system is risk-based. So it's not that we're moving away from the risk-based approach. And we don't see actually a reason to abolish it because with all the caveats and all the difficulties, we think it has worked uh, quite well. Uh, but however, we need to make sure that when risks are relevant for the European Union, we also need to act at union level. And uh, so this is the, the, the good balance we need uh, to strike. Um, Maybe a few other things I wanted to share with you already today. I think we also have to look about the scope of this new regulation, especially when it comes to the sectors covered by AML rules in our proposal. I think, first of all, uh, it is also clear that the world has not does not stand still and financial activities happening more and more digitally. We are now making this experience in the corona pandemic, although there was already a trend before to go to more digital tools. But I think it's also clear, and that's also why we still meet today in a video conference, that this trend uh, for more digital services will certainly uh, accelerate. So we have to, to address this, and the first step uh, in this area would be to cover all types of virtual asset service providers as obliged entities. And this would also be in alignment with the latest FATF uh, standards. And this would, from our point of view, also mean that we need to ensure the traceability of transfers of virtual assets to cover the, the whole uh, chain. So this is something we plan uh, to add uh, also in the scope of, you know, we have this uh, transfer of funds uh, regulation so that full details of the sender, but also of the beneficiary accompany these uh, transfers. Uh, we plan also to deepen the level of detail in some areas that are already included in the AML directive, and some of them are rather new. Customer due diligence is not a new concept, but here again, there we see some necessity for reform. Uh, we would also need to look a little bit more in the rules that are still quite new on beneficial, beneficial ownership. And in this context, uh, an important component uh, of the rulebook uh, will be legally binding technical standards. 
that should be developed by this future body. I uh, will come to that in a, in a second. Uh, this is also for us important because we think it would bring more uh, granularity uh, to the top level rules we often have in EU legislation in the regulation, but also to bring more harmonization, which is one of our uh, big uh, um, objectives, as I, as I said in the beginning of my a presentation. And just to give you one concrete example, uh, where more technical standards would be planned and needed would be customer due diligence. Um, there are then risks um, that have not yet been uh, fully mitigated yet. Uh, and this relates to cash transfer, uh, because cash is not only king, as Europol says, but is also uh, very uh, much uh, characterized by anonymity. And I know this is a subject that will certainly keep us uh, busy in the negotiations. Uh, but I think we have to be uh, very uh, clear how, how the situation is. And uh, I was just referring to Europol. It is a fact that most proceeds of criminal activity are still made in cash because it's not so much traceable. Uh, and this cash is invested in many uh, things, uh, especially real estate. We have had a lot of cases that are really preoccupying, uh, but also high value goods just to disguise uh, the uh, illegal origin. I mean, it's not that we have been blind about this uh, problem. Risks are already re reflected in the current rules uh, we have which uh, today make operators trading in goods uh, subject to AML rules when they receive or make payments worse than 10,000 euro or more. But uh, frankly, I think we have also to recognize that this has not worked so well. So uh, we are looking into something that would be a sort of uh, upper limit threshold for cash purchases. Yeah, as I said, I expect some discussion here. Some member states are more attached to, to cash uh, than others. On the other hand, there are already a number of member states that have already decided to impose uh, ceilings that may be lower with what we may come at uh, EU level. Uh, and as I said, others do not have cash limits and um, may be a bit concerned that this is the first step to abolish cash, but this is not our intention. It's just to uh, address the problem of anonymity. Um, we have something in mind about 10,000 euro, although again, everything that I say today is not politically validated, uh, but at least to give you an idea. Uh, and we think this, uh, threshold uh, would possibly be high enough not to put into question the euro as legal tender, also not to affect uh, financial inclusion because not everybody else has uh, a bank account. But at the same time, we think it also has to be low enough to make it more difficult for criminals to launder large sums of cash. So let me come uh, to the second uh, big angle of uh, what we're planning with our reform. This is the idea to set up an authority at uh, EU level. Uh, and for that one, I would also like to give you a few ideas, a uh, sneak preview what we think the, uh, the task of such an authority should be. First of all, we think we need a direct supervisor at EU level. Uh, this would not be the supervisor of each and every um, financial or credit institution or whatever who will have to deal uh, with uh, financial transfers. The direct supervision should uh, go for limited number of financial sector entities. And it should be those that are essentially cross-border in nature uh, and also uh, having a very high uh, risk uh, category. So it's not, uh, uh, let's say, the notary who is uh, working in one, one member state, but we are really speaking about big, big cross-border uh, financial institutions that may also present a systemic risk. Um, the second task, as we see it at least, uh, should be that this uh, authority should uh, act as a coordinator, or we can also call it overseer of national supervisors, or more or less the supervisor of the supervisor. Um, for other entities. Um, and there we think we should also not exclude completely the non-financial sector, uh, maybe with a bit of a lighter touch, uh, given the diversity and specificity of those sectors. 
The third uh, big task would be that this authority uh, should uh, act uh, to foster the cooperation of financial intelligence units, where we see also a, a need to uh, yeah, bring them more together, uh, let them work better, better together. And then there are two other um, tasks that may maybe not so fancy as the ones I have just mentioned, but I think it's also very much important that we have a regulatory body that would help us uh, preparing the technical standards. It's a little bit what uh, in the in the same vein as uh, what we have now with the with the European supervisory authorities in banking, um, in uh, in markets and uh, insurances. And, and last but not least, I think we would also need a bit of a think tank uh, that would help us in the Commission uh, on trends uh, in AML, especially also when it comes to trends and risks that are outside the EU. So, as, as you see, um, this authority, if it becomes true, uh, would combine under one roof both uh, supervisory uh, and coordination and support tasks. Um, but at least we believe that this is likely to generate also synergies because an agency uh, costs money, so it has to be um, uh, successful and, and functioning. Uh, and also, in the end, I think it would be good to have a better understanding of the overall risks uh, in AML and uh, financing of terrorism that the union is facing. And I said it already, whether they are internal or coming from, from, from the outside. This is really something that is lacking for the moment that we have, a, let's say, a liquid deep pool of, of all, all this uh, information. Uh, with that, uh, we would indeed create a mechanism where the union is, is well aware of the risks uh, it faces and also the measures taken at many, many different levels. This is also something we're really sometimes blind. And this is independently whether we speak about competent authorities, uh, obliged entities to allow us all together to better mitigate and address very precisely uh, these uh, risks. And maybe one, a few more words on this role of supervisor. I mean, we think that the role as a direct supervisor for large uh, entities, but also as an indirect uh, supervisor should be complementary. Uh, as stated already, only the riskiest uh, financial institutions would be directly uh, supervised, thus relieving national supervisors of a significant task, but I have to say also about a significant burden, because we have seen often in cases uh, that the national supervisors were often quite small uh, entities uh, were simply not, not able to, to cope with this uh, very uh, often very, very complex, complex tasks. Um, when it comes to the direct supervision, we have a bit uh, looked what we have already with the SSM. I mean, it's certainly not 100% comparable. Uh, but at least uh, a bit on the on the architecture and how the work will uh, be done uh, in practice. I think there is a good idea that we would couple this direct supervision also via joint uh, supervisory teams where also national supervisors would be included. We think it has uh, proven quite well for the prudential side as it's already the case uh, for the banks now. And this would also have uh, in our view, a good side effect, bringing better together the people working in the agency, but also the, the national supervisors. Of course, there is uh, one important point I was already slightly referring to. Uh, I mean, who has to pay for that? Uh, who, because this agency is not for free. Um, and uh, at least our uh, initiative or our idea would be that we would have a sort of uh, dual funding uh, it, uh, a number of um, funds would need to come from obliged uh, entity uh, to also avoid to have a too excessive uh, burden on the EU, uh, EU, EU budget. Uh, but of course, and I think we will certainly have a possibility to discuss this uh, in our panel, that uh, we would make sure that these fees remain reasonable and bearable for obliged entities. Uh, maybe a few uh, sneak previews again, uh, what we have in mind about the timing. Okay, there's a lot of question marks, of course. Uh, first, the commissioner has to do the proposal, then we will have to have uh, intense negotiations uh, with the co-legislator. 
Uh, but we uh, do not want to lose time. We want to do this swiftly with good quality, but swiftly. So let's say our vision would be to get this agency off the ground in 2024. Uh, then it would still need some time to get it up and running. Uh, but uh, I think we would at least need to have it uh, starting direct uh, supervision in 2026. Um, okay, I have been quite prominent on what we have in the package because I think this is at least for many of you of, of great interest. Uh, just before I finish to say this is of course not the only um, element, the angle we are working on uh, in our many strands uh, on AML CFT policies. Um, we have also very, in my view, good and interesting initiative on public-private uh, partnerships where we plan to launch a consultation rather soon uh, with a view to publishing guidance by the end of uh, this year. Um, and I think I would also like to share with you the good news that we are making a very good progress towards uh, a very uh, practical achievement that concerns uh, the new uh, beneficial ownership national registers that have to be interconnected at EU level. So uh, the interconnection should, if all goes well, uh, still be operational later this year. And I think this is also uh, quite good news. So uh, you see a very active time in the AML field uh, for the Commission, but then, of course, also for our um, cooperation with, uh, with uh, co-legislator once uh, we have the proposal out of the pocket. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, I would like to repeat what I said in my introduction. We are not with zero, but we firmly believe that more needs to be done uh, in the EU. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm always optimistic, I have to say. But this time, I'm even more optimistic that uh, with the proposal we will come. This is a bold package. Uh, we will be able to lay down solid foundations in the EU for a robust AML CFT regime, which hopefully will then stand the test of time. And with that, I finish. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. That was quite a sneak preview and um, I think a lot of uh, things to unpack. We want to uh, keep this session conversational, so I will uh, uh, ask uh, the panelists not to make uh, too long speeches at the outset. We'll, we'll take the topics uh, in different batches, uh, but with that, uh, I, I'll be uh, very eager to hear what uh, Sven and Sebastian have to say on this prospect for reform. So uh, first thing. Yes, uh, first uh, I would like to thank uh, you, Nicola, and, uh, and also Mr. Malecki for bringing us together and uh, also for managing to get Alexandra to provide us with this sneak preview. Um, we as parliamentarians also receive that information, but always in a format that we cannot share it with anyone else. And now it's all in the open, and therefore this is uh, really great news. So thanks a lot, Mr. Malecki. So beyond that, Alexandra knows my offensive jokes already. Uh, she had to suffer from it already several times. So uh, I always try to invent something new. But on the substance, I must say, look, um, the Commission is finally moving uh, on these issues in the right direction, uh, it, and the, the speed uh, has increased. So it all started with the big uh, scandals, uh, and uh, until then there was a long complacency that we had rules, they were not enforced, Commission was looking somewhere else, uh, and not enforcing these rules. We all know the story. Nicola has written lots of articles about it. Everybody was angry about it. But then there came the scandals and political willingness increase in the parliament, in council, and a commission is now acting. And I would say generally these proposals all go in the right direction. They are bold steps forward. So uh, let's look forward uh, uh, into the future. Uh, only very briefly, some quick reactions. So uh, first, when it comes to supervision, the key question to me is, obviously the SSM model is an interesting one to say biggest risk, biggest actors, direct powers, but what is crucial for the ECB is if they perceive a problem with the 
less important actors, they can step in. So such a power to take over supervisory functions when member states are not acting. This is to me absolutely critical because what we see today is that in some pockets, member states are simply not delivering. Cyprus, Latvia, Germany, lots of uh, sectors where the member states, for whatever reasons, are not delivering. And there, a European actor should have the power to step in. Second, uh, when it comes to the FIU, uh, it is important that this FIU receives real investigatory functions uh, in cases of a large cross-border nature. So uh, they must have powers to really investigate cases. And for this, they need access to the data which is needed to do so. So in particular, the data and, um, and information collected by obliged entities in cross-border situations. Uh, but of course, the core, I, uh, I won't uh, issue more a longer speech, but one issue I would like to make in any case is that the key issue is enforcement. And here, uh, even if we now strengthen the rule book, uh, create new uh, actors and institutions, this should not let us be idle for the next years with weak enforcement. We must use the opportunities for strict enforcement of the, in principle, already good rules since 2007 with the AML3. And I, uh, Alexandra knows uh, that I will say that on every panel, open infringement cases on all the member states not implementing the law. The evidence is there. FRTF is documenting it. Uh, Commission has the evidence. We have case evidence. Uh, we have reports of the Court of Auditors of the member states for Germany demonstrating the whole mess. So there have to be not only infringement cases based on bad transposition of this or that article, the, the infringement cases have to be based on the lack of effective implementation in the member states. And there we need more staff in the commission, more cases, more cases quickly put to the court. And therefore, we have to use the major opportunities. And I will only name one uh, at the moment. Yesterday, the Eurogroup gave a green light uh, for the next steps to integrate Croatia and Bulgaria into the euro. Croatia has no doubtedly made great progress, but in Bulgaria, corruption is not really prosecuted. And in the banking systems, in, in particular in the smaller institutions, there is a huge systemic problem with financial crime. We may not allow a new Latvia to emerge. No new member state should enter the euro until they have holistically tackled financial crime. And this is so important in the Bulgarian case. So uh, if Croatia is ready, let them join. If Bulgaria doesn't clean up on corruption and financial crime, they have to do their homework first. And the ECB so far is shying away from looking into the smaller banks. They have looked at the larger ones and the smaller ones of which everybody knows what's going on. It's all documented. It's a big taboo. And I ask the institutions uh, to take this problem seriously. We can't afford another case of, uh, of a state joining the euro without tidying up financial crime first. Well, that's um, uh, a challenge. Uh, and uh, I will want to hear from Alexandra, but first, uh, Sebastian. Um, thanks, Nicola. I hope you can hear me, me well. Let me also thank, of course, the, the organizer, Mr. Maleki. I think really it's, it's a great panel, great timing indeed also to discuss uh, IML ahead of the, well, to a certain extent, long awaited uh, package from the, from the uh, European uh, Commission. So I'm very pleased to be, to be with you. It's, of course, a very, very important topic for the banking sector as well. Um, it has become a, 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 one of the most important priorities for us. Um, and, well, 
what is what is also uh, interesting in in AML, and that's not always the case. I think is that we we, we share uh, most of the views, which were already expressed, by the way, by the Commission, but also by by Sven Giegel. Um So. Um, Maybe in a, in, a, in a nutshell, yes, uh, we, we very much support the uh, reform uh, proposed by, by the Commission. Of course, we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the package in, in, in very much details. Um, I think our assessment of the, the shortcomings after the, the too many scandals, which happened a few, a few months or years ago, uh, in the banking sector or sometimes outside the banking sector were relatively similar to those um, made by uh, by the commission in the post post mortem assessments um, and so yes the regulatory framework as it exists is outdated for us it was ample time to to modernize it um, and i think in the, the, we saw indeed three main shortcomings that we think indeed the um, commission now is trying to address and that's a good thing uh, one was of course the regulatory fragmentation and the supervisory fragmentation uh, both were already uh, uh, mentioned, which of course created a lot of concern issue, not only for the, uh, uh, I would say, regulated supervisors, but also for um, international banks or European banks, uh, which had to deal with many different requirements. Um, and then very, very important as well, and that's also something we would like to see in the, in the AML package, and I don't know to which extent this will also uh, moved on is of course the um, the barriers to, to information sharing uh, because we, we strongly believe that we uh, we need to move a bit uh, from from um, a compliance stick to the box uh, I would say approach in AML to a much more intelligence led um, uh, approach and that's for us the the, the best way at the end to uh, to tackle uh, crime uh, and, and, and money laundering. Um, so we, 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 we sometimes forget this, this part of the, 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 the debate and focusing too much, in my view, on the, on the compliance by obliged entity. What we need is, of course, to be efficient in tackling um, a crime. Um, no, um, so full support. Um, on, on the IML authorities, Nicolas, I, I don't know, um, we, we generally, I will not go into the detail, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll discuss that further. Um, I will discuss that further. Uh, so, in a, in a, a few, few, few words, uh, we are uh, generally supportive, we're a bit agnostic whether it should be an existing entity or a new entity, that's not the most important for us. What is important is indeed that it brings value. Uh, um, so that it uh, will increase the efficiency of the framework and, and do not only add uh, a layer of, of, of reporting. So I think, as, as mentioned, very important also that it plays a, a role also in coordinating the um, exchange of information at, at your level, but also uh, in, in, in FIUs, or between FIUs, as, as mentioned, because there is still a lot to do um, uh, at this level. Um, no, very important also that for us, it's not only the, the scope of, the, of direct supervision is not only based on the on the size, but more on the risk, and perhaps also then it extended to to non-financial uh, institution when uh, consider high uh, risk. Um, so the, the the scope perhaps not. On, on direct supervision should or should indeed encompass also non, the, the non-financial sector in our, in our opinion um, and there in, in direct supervision when there is higher risk as I mentioned. Now the authority and I will close with that we will need of course adequate resources uh, be, be staffed uh, and, and, and I also have a, a well, proper funding. What is key for us and you, you, you will, you will uh, not be surprised of course that we avoid I mean, duplication for the banks that they would have to pay twice, one for the national level, one for the European level. To a certain extent, there should be um, somewhere a, a compensation. Otherwise, uh, there is something wrong. That means that we do not go to more efficiencies either. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, I will pick up on what you said, uh, Sebastian, on FIUs and uh, information sharing and ask Sven about this. 
Sven, uh, you've been one who has pushed a lot for FIU uh, functions to be um, a main plank of this reform and not just AML supervision. Um, are you uh, confident that your concerns are being addressed uh, with the sneak preview, or uh, do you think this will still be a, a, a weak spot in the whole architecture? Well, the parliament was asking for creating a financial police. I have to admit, we were quite after this, uh, but we had a broad majority for this. And uh, what does financial police mean? Uh, so, uh, and we were quite clear in our resolutions. On the one hand, it's welcome that Europol has allocated more staff uh, on economic and financial crime. So we are clearly seeing their pressure growing. But if we compare the staffing of uh, Europol as a whole with the American FBI, we are seeing what is really going wrong in Europe. We have internationalized organized crime, internationalized uh, financial crime as a consequence, uh, and uh, we have national and partly local police with a little institution on the European level. So therefore, it is uh, it should be part of the whole program to look at the same time at capacities of prosecution. And, uh, and this is what, why we were always saying FISMA has a key role, but there's equally a role for other DGs. So only if we also look at police and the European prosecutor, we can have the respective effect. And in the area of, um, of analyzing cases, the FIU is basically important, but it is only, that's the only part in the responsibility of FISMA. So, uh, so therefore, uh, I was mentioning that first uh, with police and the prosecutors. When you look at the FIU, of course, we know why it's so sensitive. So if you take, get, you need in order to do cross-border analysis, uh, you need to analyze these suspicious transaction reports, which have a cross-border dimension. Member states will be hesitant to share that. But that is needed if we want to fight crime on a cross-border basis. And therefore, I will look uh, very carefully in the proposal whether uh, the new so-called coordination and support mechanism, uh, which where you can already see in the name that they were shying away from it. So that is the wording from the council. I'm now curious how this will be called in the final uh, proposal. But there you can see already the hesitation. Eh? We are not doing anything ourselves. We are only coordinating and supporting. I know Commission wanted to go further, so uh, I don't accuse Commission here, but the whole wording shows already the problem. And the, But the key thing is they must get access to the respective data so that the large cross-border cases can be analyzed. Otherwise, it will continue, as we often see it in complex financial crime cases, at least in Germany. I see a strong tendency to only open to prosecute criminals only on what they do on the national level because local prosecutors say everything international is so complicated it, it will take so much resources so that often it's absurd you have a big international crime network and you get then caught for any minor violation of law uh, which is a local one because uh, prosecutors shy away from opening the complex cases, they are too right. cumbersome to um, to research. So therefore, I would give it back to Alexandra to let us know a bit more how powerful this coordination and support mechanism will now be and whether you invented a more fancy title for it. Alexandra. Oh, sorry, I was I was muted. No, th thank you very much. Um, I would perhaps like uh, to make uh, one remark on information sharing that goes to both. Uh, it's a bit a different subject uh, uh, to Sebastian, who had also a point about uh, the need uh, that information is is better shared from obliged entities to the FIUs, where of course there is uh, this important. Well, once uh, you get the suspicious transaction and then you, you need to see whether you give it to the FIU or not. Um, and of course, then uh, to, to Sven's point about uh, 
Yeah, what should be the role of this uh, new, new authority, especially when it comes uh, to the F, uh, FIUs? But also, and I think that I, I very much uh, agree. We uh, sometimes on the on the details we allow ourselves to disagree a bit. But I think on on the on the point that uh, we need not to look into one actor, but we need to look into all actors and how we can bring them together. I think I, I very much uh, agree with him. I mean, I mean, first of all, if I may, uh, just uh, on on the Bastian's point, I think there is. Uh, there is, I mean, we understand the, that, uh, and this is also, I think, very much linked to our idea to have a bigger private-public partnership. I think there is a is a point. Uh, what uh, is the information that you need to share because you get it? You somehow see, okay, there's something going wrong here uh, with all the transactions. But uh, sometimes I think you are uh, in the position that you say we sent everything. Because in the end, if you are not sending one uh, and something goes wrong, then we are sanctioned. And there may be a good reason to sanction because something has been overlooked. Uh, but sometimes I think there is a bit the question of uh, proportionality. And I think it would be important possibly for the obliged entity, maybe not in a concrete case, but so somehow get a bit more in the dialogue also with the FIUs that uh, you get also the feedback from the gatekeepers. Okay, this is, don't bother us with this uh, because this is this is not really. In the end, it turns out there is no money laundering involved. But please be very very vigilant on cases where really problems occur. So I think we we understand uh, the point. I think there is always a bit of uh, nothing is easy in this field about uh, who who gets information when. This is all very sensitive. What about data protection? I mean, you also have your clients, of course, uh, but I, I, I would simply say that uh, that I, I see where you come from. And at least from our point of view, um, being better on public-private partnership is, is certainly uh, one of the tools we could use. Then indeed, let me come a bit to the, let's say, the, the overall picture. And, and I, I think the, um, there is a bit, um, how can I say that, uh, still a bit of a difference between um, what uh, what I would call um, uh, vision and real politic. Um, I, I would very much agree, as I said already, that uh, we need all the actors talking to each other. And this is not only about, let's say, still in the preventive side, but also in the end uh, when uh, the, the law enforcement or the judicial authorities uh, are coming in. Um, and this, this is not something I would say, I mean, you, you can use legislation to somehow enforce it. Uh, but uh, let's also not uh, have an illusion here. I think this also needs trust that uh, this information can be shared. And this is an argument, and, and Sven will hear it all the time, and we hear it as well. And I think it's not really wrong, in, uh, at least. I mean, in the end, also the police is, is very careful in sharing information, and I understand where they come from. But there, I would say we all need still to work more. We are not well, at zero. If, I, if, I I if, you, uh, if an FIU has information, why is it so difficult to give it to the police and the other way around? And I have already had some experience with a proposal the Commission was making some time ago about cooperation Sorry, law enforcement and FIUs and no. FIUs between FIUs. And I think we made a first step, uh, which is, uh, again, I'm an optimist. That was good, but we also feel that more needs to be done. And maybe I can put it this way with the new authorities. We would take a second step and see how this with this organ uh, authority involved uh, we can even enhance better the, the the trust building process and then let's reassess it and and uh, take it from there i mean again what i wanted to also say in my introduction we really want to make progress quickly i mean i'm not the one who says speed goes before quality but if we start now uh, setting up a european uh, FBI, um, and I have a lot of experience, and so I know this as well with the European Public Prosecutor's Office, it will take us 10 years from today. And therefore, my experience is sometimes it's better to do it step by step, to bring the people together, to let them also feel simply comfortable that you can share information without being under risk that uh, it, it will be leaked or goes in, in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, of course, not everybody will think we are sufficiently ambitious, but 
there is a bit of a real politic in European politics. And I think this is not only for money laundering. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, Alexander, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned time horizons and, uh, and also the, the need for trust. Uh, you said uh, it shouldn't take 10 years. The, the timeline you suggested suggests five years uh, between now and the moment when we will have the direct supervisory function uh, in place. And I'm not criticizing this because it takes time to put systems in place. But my question is about setting up um, capability. And, and frankly, this is not uh, about new agency versus existing agency, but really uh, creating an operational capability. I think we have had in the recent past uh, a number of experiences with EU agencies. Frontex comes to mind. Uh, we could also make some comments perhaps about the SRB, where the creation of capabilities in new agencies has not been easy. Uh, so how do you look at those lessons and are you have you put in place, in, if I can put it this way, a mechanism to take those lessons on board so that the uh, establishment of this new capability in the agency for AML supervision would uh, not be marred from the beginning with severe operational deficiencies, which could, of course, erode trust from the start? What, is, uh, what, what, what kind of, um, if I can put it very bluntly, how, how do you make sure that uh, the AML authority will not run into the same uh, problems uh, at Frontex? Thank you very much, Nicolas. I think that is a, that is a absolutely a valid, a valid comment. And again, I mean, we have, as I said, the proposal is not uh, out yet, and there are still, of course, some in, internal discussions uh, how, in the end, uh, it should be best done. I think what is a bit easier maybe in this case is that we are not starting with completely, let's say, on a green table. It's not the first EU agency uh, one would set up. I mean, we, we have uh, also have maybe lessons learned. Um, I think, first of all, uh, it is important to see what do you want to achieve and what is your objective. And that's why I was also quite explicit on what should be the task of the agency. And from that, to see how this can best be achieved. I mean, from, from my um, perspective, it is, first of all, what is very important is independence. And I think this is a, a key feature we will need to have uh, in this uh, authority. Of course, we will have to have the, let's say, the budgetary control uh, with, uh, with the parliament and the council, but uh, that the agency uh, is, uh, is not, let's say, dependent from undue influence. Um, Okay, we have now, I mean, I, from my personal perspective, I can say, I mean, I have worked uh, a lot of my, my years on the European Public Prosecutor's Office, where we also were very keen to have it an independent body. Okay, now we have it and uh, we hope it, uh, it will work. But there, indeed, at least you need to uh, also structure it in a way that uh, it gives uh, the necessary uh, independence. The next point is, of course, expertise. And there has always, uh, there is always be this, uh, but member states can do it themselves, a lot of good people people all, all, uh, across the board, and I'm not putting that at all into question. There are excellent experts in AML uh, in all the member states and, and elsewhere, but uh, you need to find the right people to put them there and to let them do the work. And that, of course, also needs the right uh, s surrounding uh, conditions. Uh, so in the end, you really have a, have a pool of expertise and not somebody is sitting in one member state and maybe he or she could ask somebody in another member said, but they don't know how to get together. And I have also seen, I must say, some positive results uh, in, the, in the work with, with Eurojust that is still something different, where it was in the end quite easy. You just uh, go and, and, and talk to your colleagues. So the, the, the necessary expertise uh, of uh, the people working there is, is, also, is also very important. And then, uh, again, a point I made is I think we still, even if we have such a body, it's not an island. I mean, it needs to be working closely with the national authorities. That's why it's so important to have the joint teams. Because they will also learn from each other. They will certainly also contribute to building this trust, which is so important. Uh, and I would say I mean, there are certainly uh, other aspects, uh, but uh, these in our view, have to be put together 
And with that, at least, I think we have a quite good recipe for a, a new body that will, in the end, uh, not make things more complicated, but uh, really contribute uh, to the, making things better. Thank you. Uh, Sven, uh, how do you look at this risk? Execution risk, uh, Frontex risk, if I can put it again, maybe too simplistically, um, for an agency which is uh, aimed at having uh, its own operational capability? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I also have that experience with the creation of the ESAS, and uh, we have learned some lessons. So I was founding rapporteur for ESMA and following since uh, IOPA and EBA closely, and uh, that's why we know each other, Nicola, and we have been through the ups and downs uh, of that. And I think we can learn a lot of lessons from there. So first, uh, the the agencies are not truly independent. They are not depend. They are dependent mainly on the national authorities. If you have a lot of member states where money laundering is not supervised effectively, and the agencies is controlled by representatives of national agencies, then the whole thing will not deliver. It, then we can have a, an executive director uh, or a chair being nominated uh, somehow by council and parliament, I hope, but these will be, they need to have the right power. Ideally, such an agency will deliver best if there's a leadership whose career is directly bound to the success of their operations and which have, a, a, in the end, also the power to take decisions against even the will of a certain number of uh, member authorities. And this is, of course, very difficult, not because the commission didn't know it, but they, uh, they know it very well, uh, but because member states uh, are eagerly defending their control over EU agencies. And we, we are still lacking, because also of resistance of the council, uh, a uniform, uh, rules-based uh, supervision and, 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 re and um, governance structure for the EU agencies. So they are all very different. They have all sorts of conflicts of interest, inefficiencies, uh, and uh, different, le different levels of democratic control. Uh, and, uh, and here now the question is, uh, are we able to take the lessons uh, learned uh, from uh, existing agencies, and are we able uh, to put efficiency first uh, over uh, concerns by member states that if they give this authority too much efficiency, they will create a lot of problems in their own country with their own inefficiency. And this is how we got to this point, because EBA did not take action, although they had the mandate against the violation of EU law in some member states in the field of controlling certain criminal banks. And, uh, and, and therefore now the test will be, will this EU AML agency be in a better governance position to take decisions? Otherwise, we haven't won anything. Right. And unlike Sebastian, only to make that point, we have a expressed a clear preference not to put this to an existing agency because we know how sensitive EBA, ESMA and so on and the national control in this area is. So we would never be able to solve that problem in one of the existing financial agencies right. and therefore it needs a new one. Yeah. Uh, Alexandra, uh, can you gave us a lot in the sneak preview. Can you uh, in addition, uh, give us a sense of whether that agency will pass that test of being able to go against uh, national authorities' um, resistances better than EBA did in the case that Sven mentioned. You're on mute. Sorry, no, but no. Sorry, and I, I think what I can tell you today, and I have already been quite outspoken, uh, is certainly uh, going in uh, addressing the concerns uh, Sven has raised. I think it really, in the end, it depends also how you uh, structure the governance inside the agency. Uh, whether you have a, a board uh, with uh, 50 people who have all 
to get unanimity on something that is sensitive or whether you do this a bit differently. And there, uh, I think there are lots of elements one can play with. Again, uh, as I said, we are a bit lucky that this is not the first agency we are setting up. I think there is always, and this is not a criticism, but there is always lessons to be learned and we should be open to see what works, what does not work. So I think on this one, how it will exactly look like, you need to have a bit of patience, but I can tell you today that the problem to make it in a way that there is no undue uh, influence it has been well understood and we try to do it in a way that this will be addressed. There's a related question, um, and I'll ask you, uh, because we, we don't have that much time left, I'll ask you to make relatively short answers, even, so, even if that makes us simplistic. But um, something you didn't cover in the sneak preview, I think there was some implicit coverage, but uh, will the agency be able to uh, impose financial penalties directly to uh, its supervised entities? I mean, that is maybe also something that goes a bit beyond a sneak preview. Uh, but as I said, uh, <laughs> and you still have to be a bit uh, excited when the when the movie starts. So uh, wow. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is why you have a sneak preview. It <laughs> excites. Uh, no, but it's, 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 a to, it's a reason to go see the movie because that, that's a major criterion for effectiveness, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And what I can say is, I mean, what I was saying is that there will not only be a supervisory function for obliged entities and institutions, but it will also create a somewhat a system of a supervisor or the supervisor, which is certainly a little bit nuanced, but it would not make sense to have it if it's completely tasteless. Um, Sven mentioned the Bulgarian small banks, and I don't want to go into stereotyping here, uh, but uh, but that's obviously a concern. Uh, and um, and I know, Sven, you didn't want to go into stereotyping either. Uh, you're referring to very specific I have to say, uh, I, this is based on a lot of case evidence. Uh, uh, I only recommend to read OCCRP, uh, the respective cases. Uh, and thanks for that reference. Uh, so that raises the issue of one thing that the um, ECB has been uh, pointing out a lot, uh, which is fit and pro uh, I think in the studio we're hearing a music. Oh, that's probably to tell us where we should end soon. <laughs> Actually, the feature, not a bug, sorry. Um, uh, in, um, so that will be my last question to you, Alexandra. Um, the ECB has often pointed to the need to uh, streamline fit and proper assessment for uh, bank executives. And that's an area that uh, is not harmonized at this point in EU banking legislation. Will that be part of the package or will it be considered separately or not at all? Sorry. No, I think this is, uh, I mean, you know, the fit and proper comes from the Prudential uh, side, uh, but uh, what I can again tell you today is it's certainly also something we we look into, and then we will see it when you read the proposal. Well, um, the music is putting it us in the uh, in the uh, lunch room, I guess. Um, I apologize to Sebastian because I had also more questions to you. I didn't have time to ask them. Uh, I um, I had also one question from the audience uh, on. Uh, digital assets from uh, Salah Hajtanaz, uh, and apologize that we didn't have time to uh, address it comprehensively, so blame me for that. Uh, I want to thank our speakers, and especially Alexandra, who was, I think, very forthcoming with a lot of details for a trailer. So, uh, so, so that, was, uh, that was very uh, informative to me, and I think to our audience as well. Uh, there is a break now. Uh, enjoy your lunch, uh, and uh, we will continue. Uh, the, the conference will continue at 2 p.m. Central European time uh, with uh, with the panel on uh, law enforcement. Thanks very much to everybody, and particularly to Alexandra, Sven, and Sebastian uh, for this, I think, extremely informative panel. Thanks a lot.